Welcome everyone. I'm Dr. John White, Chief Medical Officer at WebMD, and you're watching Coronavirus in Context. We've been talking all day about vaccines. Well, remember, vaccines don't work if people don't take them. And there's some hesitancy among different communities about the vaccine. So to help provide some insights, I've asked my friend, Dr. Sharon Allison Audi, the Executive Director of the Koshar Healthy Communities Foundation. Dr. Allison Audi, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. Really love the work that you're doing. Let's get right at it. You've been talking about vaccine hesitancy, particularly in communities of color. Can you talk about what your latest research is showing? Well, we have conducted the largest study of particularly African American slash Blacks in this country on uh, COVID uh, attitudes, but also the vaccine. And it really was very alarming with over 94%, and, and we surveyed about 3,100 validated studies in a scientific manner saying, I don't want the vaccine, or I may or may not take the vaccine, et cetera. And that has a person that's worked in health disparities now for decades is so troubling to me. We have a flu vaccine campaign, HPV vaccine, all of these vaccine campaigns. And now with the greatest pandemic of certainly in my lifetime, um, this community needs to jump on board. What's so frustrating, I would imagine, here we have a disease, COVID-19, that is disproportionately impacting people of color. We have a vaccine strategy to protect people Yet those that are most at risk are saying, hey, wait, I want more information. What more information do folks need? Help us, you know, think it through and how we can get more people on board. There must be information from trusted resources. And that's why at the foundation, we are engaging our churches, our community leaders, certainly social and civic leaders to say, hey, this is safe. But also we are highlighting what you and I both have talked about for decades, that for one of the first times in history, the most diverse panel of clinical trial participants are in this trial. And after all of that work, saying that this has been tested in people that look like you uh, to a larger degree, this is safe, but more importantly, you could save a life. It, that has to be communicated and we need to break it down to the basics. Vaccines save lives. We're in a pandemic. You not only want to protect yourself, you want to protect your grandmother, your mother, your kids, your whole entire family. And we must do this as a nation. Are you seeing generational issues? When, when I talk to older patients, people of color, they'll talk about Tuskegee and mention it. Yes. But when you talk about Tuskegee to a younger population, they'll think you're talking about the airmen. That's right. They're not yeah. really aware yeah. the school. <laughs> of the issues around syphilis. Right. So yeah. what are the generational issues we're seeing in terms of vaccine confidence and vaccine acceptance? You know, I've always liked to keep it straight. And I keep it straight when I talk to anyone. We we go back to, to, to the Tuskegee experiment, and unfortunately, I've seen a lot of misnomers and misinformation even about that, as it's now coming back to the forefront. But this generation and the millennials and, and even younger generations, they talk about just distrust of government, uh, that it's too fast and we're gonna be guinea pigs and all of that, and why do I wanna inject something foreign into my body? now? Mind you, as I keep it real all the time, this same generation will say, I don't want to inject anything or smoke, take anything, but we have legalized pot. We have the chicken sandwich with a thousand calories. We have uh, processed food and all of that. And I break it down, honestly, John, to that level and say, wait a minute. Well, if that's the case, are you following this in every aspect of your life? And the other part that is hitting home with particularly my 20 and 30 year olds, and I just did a webinar recently, 
is when I go over and say, this is what a clinical trial is. This is what had to happen. And these are the structures by which a vaccine can come through. Not one person, but panels and panels of persons and the safety issue. Tell us how you, as a woman of color, not as a doctor, mm -hmm. but a woman of color, a mom, is evaluating the risk versus benefit mm -hmm. in terms of whether or not you're going to get the vaccine. Can you, can you walk us through that calculation that you personally are making that our viewers can, can relate to? The biggest thing I can say to anyone is I have an 80-year-old mother, soon to be 81. And she asked me, well, what about this vaccine? I said, mommy, the first day it's available that I can get you in, you're Why? getting vaccinated. Why? Why? Because my mother is 80 years old with some hypertension in North Carolina where there is iffy mask wearing, major health problems as far as perceptions about the virus. And I want to protect her at all costs. It's the same reason I wasn't there at Thanksgiving or Christmas or any of the major holidays. I want to protect her. Why is it important? We are in the greatest crises of our lifetime. What can we do? We know we can do the things that we talk about, but now we have another tool in the toolbox. For me, making those decisions is easy because I read the data. I am very adept to understanding a clinical trial, but also I am a voice, fortunately for this country that is trusted, that can say, no, this is safe and this is something we must What's do. What's been striking about the data? Is it the number of people, the outcomes, the, the, the numerous studies? What's particularly struck you about the data? If we talk about the Pfizer-Moderna vaccine, 94%, above 90% of any vaccination uh, having efficacy rates, you and I both know that is off the charts. The efficacy data is what has sold me. What happens, Sharon, if we have a large percentage of Caucasians being vaccinated and then a very small percentage of people of color and, and we still have a lot of virus around? What's the outcome there? We know what it is. We know what it is. And again, for you have done a lot of work in health disparities. I've done a lot of work in health disparities. Certain organizations that I'm part of and other influential persons, it is heartbreaking to me um, that after all of this time saying, we are at risk more, get to the front of the line, get to, finally you're at the front of the line and you say, oh, I'm skeptical, I don't wanna be at the front of the line necessarily, I wanna see how this works out. And as a result, our parents, our grandparents, our families suffer more because of hesitancy when we don't see this hesitancy in other areas of our lives. And so I am really, and the foundation has a national campaign going full-fledged to say vaccines save lives, not only do it for yourself, but do it for your family and so that we can get some of these restrictions lifted. You can't complain about the restrictions and sit at home and chant kumbaya saying, I'm, I'm gonna wait on something else or take a herb to try to protect myself. One of the things we've been talking about on this show is the low number of people of color in medical school mm -hmm. to become physicians and other health professions. Can we take a moment and hear about your journey into medical school and becoming a physician? Was it something that you had always dreamed of? Was it something you saw in other family members? What has been Dr. Sharon Allison Audie's pathway and journey to medicine? I, I have a cute quick story. My father, God rest his soul, uh, had we had in our hallway to all the Britannicas and people don't even know about them. <laughs> the encyclopedias, they don't know. <laughs> they don't know. And I, I was always kind of nerdy and reading them. And as a young girl, I had issues with uh, fainting and feeling lightheaded. Uh, and I'm talking about before being 10 years old, about six to seven. So I had a relationship with Dr. Baker, my local pediatrician in my small town of Kannapolis, North Carolina. Dr. Baker was a Caucasian younger man. Now I see it as younger. Uh, that was a great pediatrician that I secretly probably had a little crush on. And I just was fascinated. And I would go in for tests and all this. And at the time, I remember once he said, well, this could be sickle cell anemia. 
And my little smart self went and got the Britannica out and looked up sickle cell at the time you died by the time you were 20. And I come from a faith family. So I was praying to God, asking for forgiveness for all the evil I'd done to my brothers and say, and eating liver thinking that I could overcome this. And fortunately, I did not have sickle cell, but that started it. My daddy would say that he bought me a huge ABC book and A was for Apple and Adam, a bunch of stuff, and D was for dog, doctor. And I looked at it and said, doctor, like Dr. Baker, that's what I'm gonna be. I've never known that I wanted to be anything else, but he used to tell that story. And I was about seven when he told that story. And did you, face struggles, bias, discrimination along the way? Oh, definitely. I am from small town, Kannapolis, North Carolina, which I love. But I remember on career day, and I've talked about this publicly on career day, I was always in advanced classes and all of that, which meant that there was one black girl and one black boy in the advanced classes. And we were on an accelerated path. And I remember for career day, standing up with my great presentation saying, I'm gonna be a doctor. And I remember one of my classmates who was my friend said, well, no, you can't be a doctor. My daddy says, and she said the N word, can't be doctors. And, and, and I was crushed for about two seconds until I went home my dad got off work and I was so sad. And I said, daddy, this is what, and he came in his usual way and said, prove her wrong. Why are you upset? Prove her wrong. And uh, fortunately, 20 years later. At you did, you did just that. School, proved her wrong. I proved her wrong and got an award for being being the most successful high school, blah, blah, blah. And I remember her telling people, we we were best friends. <laughs> what a, what a <laughs> terrific story. What final words do you want to leave our viewers to give them maybe a little more confidence in mm -hmm. vaccination for COVID? Vaccinations across the board work. So we want you to be vaccinated. And we know African Americans have lower vaccination rates in everything, tetanus, boost, HPV, all, flu, all of that. But now as we face this crisis, um, I, I want to say that we must trust the scientists and the doctors. Trust resources in your community, trust national spokespersons, trust organizations that represent people as well as doctors. And as we look at frontline workers, do you think that mom that is a physician, that may be an MD, PhD, that has a family member do you think she's going to sit down and take a vaccine and risk her family, risk their health? And so follow their lead and talk to your physician or someone you trust. And then you become a spokesperson. We know that in minority communities, it takes word of mouth in particular. And I did it. I'm fine. You do it. You'll be fine so that we can get the protection we need. This is not just something political. It's not political at all. It's about your health and your wellness and the wellness of this nation is your duty to protect, to wear a mask, to follow the guidelines, but also your duty to protect your fellow man. And we do that with vaccinations. Protect our fellow man and women. And women. Well, thank you, Dr. Sharon, Allison, Audi, for your insights today, for all that you're doing to promote health and eliminate disparities across the board, not just as it relates to COVID, but something that you and I have been talking about for 20 years. So yeah. appreciate your insights today. Thank you. And if you have questions about COVID-19 and we want your questions, we want you to ask questions, send them our way. You can send them to Dr. John at webmd.net, as well as post on our social properties, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Pinterest. Thanks for watching.